Welcome back to Dead Sleep True Crime for Vet Time. I'm Nancy Miller, your host, and usually your narrator. But for this episode, I have something special. I interview people for a living. So occasionally, when I can, I love to interview people for this show. Fellow journalists and authors and other experts whose hard work helped inform the writing of previous episodes and source material. I'm excited to share that this episode will be a pleasant and informative Q&A with Dr. Emily Cockane, historian, author, and associate professor at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. Professor Cockane published a book this past year called Penning Poison, The History of Anonymous Letters. It earned a bunch of great reviews, including a glowing review in the New York Times, and I stumbled across her book while doing research for the most recent episode on Dr. James Forster, a.k.a. The Nerd. You'll remember from that episode that James Forster was an older gentleman, a respected member of the small community in Manfield, England, who terrorized nearly everyone in the village with a shocking series of threatening and vulgar letters. A poison pen case that spanned nearly 20 years. To put that episode together, I was extremely grateful to have Professor Cockaine's book on hand. Her book traces the history of poison pen letters in Great Britain from a really specific period, 1760 to 1939. But some of the material that's in this book is as relevant now as it was back then. Emily spent 12 years working on this deep dive into poison pen letters, and during that time, she was a consultant on a film about a huge poison pen scandal that happened between two women in England in the early 1920s. That film actually just came out in the States. It's an art house film in local theaters and streaming, and it's called Wicked Little Letters, and the cast is phenomenal. Olivia Coleman and Jesse Buckley, who appeared in The Lost Daughter. Anyway, it's packed with goodness, and it's also packed with complete and utter filth. And usually, we keep things pretty clean on Dead Sleep, but brace yourselves, because we're about to get dirty with one of the shocking lines that was sent to a woman in 1920s England. It was one of the letters that would send a woman to prison. Ready? You foxy ass, piss country, whore. And by the way, this is one of the less offensive phrases in these letters. Most of the stuff in the letters I, I, I can't actually read aloud. <laughs> I love foxy ass. And I enjoyed Professor Cockaine's book so much and the film that I invited her onto the show for a nice long interview about the origin of poison pen letters, how poison pen letters became known as a woman's crime, along with great history on a few of the biggest, most scandalous cases. We spoke for a while and we covered a lot, but I managed to get it down to about an hour which is longer than the usual episode, but I think you'll find there's a lot to explore in this interview. I hope you enjoy the interview. I'll be back with an all-new true crime story in a few days. So be sure to follow the show so you don't miss it. Oh, and a very quick and very grateful shout out to all of the new followers and subscribers. Dead Sleep is independent and ad-free. And I plan to keep it that way. So become a subscriber, and your $5 goes right back into making this show the best it can be. So with that, let's get cozy and comfy and settle in, as Dr. Emily Cockaine spills a bit of English tea on the surprisingly spicy history of the poison pen letter. Professor Emily Cockaine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Your book is called Penning Poison. The History of Anonymous Letters. Let's get started on how you became interested in that and how it became a book. So it was around about 2009 
And I was researching another book called Cheek by Jowl, which is a history of neighbours. And in that history of neighbours, I came across uh, the famous case now due to the film made of it, Little Hampton case from the 1920s. So Rose Gooding, who was falsely accused of writing anonymous letters by her neighbour, Edith Swan. So I hit upon that in 2009 and it changed the structure of that book. It was so important a case that I then uh, used the street it was from, so that's Western Road, uh-huh. as one of the main focus streets for that book. So there's five focus streets in that book, and one of them is Western Road in Littlehampton because of this letter campaign. So I knew I wanted to use it to sort of show how neighbours did or didn't, in this case, get on with each other, and how the proximities of neighbouring make people a bit odd. Is that The movie's called Wicked Little Letters. Um, and I watched it last night. It's available for streaming. And the movie stars two of my favorite can-do-no-wrong actors, Olivia Coleman and Jesse Buckley. And in this film, they play next-door neighbors. One is an, an Irish immigrant in a, in a small English town. And then the next-door neighbor is this old, slightly older woman known as a spinster throughout the movie who is the pious one and a good Christian. And they live side by side. And all of this starts because of a series of letters that the, quote, good one next door is receiving. So this is a hugely famous case, and and listeners can watch the movie based on that case. And in 2009, you came across this case. I did, yeah. Now, the real case is slightly different. So to make the case work for a film, you kind of have to push details, but also quite pleasantly in this case... It kind of picks up other stories from the same area and the same time that are really similar. So they all involve decoy letters. And so decoy letters are written when somebody wants to throw the police off your involvement. So why would she write this letter about herself that has secrets in it? Why would she write it to herself, this thing? Let's talk a bit about um, the definition of a poison pen letter versus, say, hate mail or blackmail or other methods and the origin of the term poison pen. So first of all, how do you define a poison pen letter? Um, I mean, I I say to start with that these letters have quite a lot of common themes and it sometimes or sort of common appearances or common elements. And sometimes they appear to be one thing, but they're actually another thing. And so it depends partly on the motivations of the writer, which we often don't know. Mm-hmm. and partly on the interpretations of the receiver. So the, there's quite a lot of similarities between these areas. Um, so let's have a think about, for example, hate mail. So hate mail could be sent not anonymously or anonymously, and it's basically just an expression of hate sent through the post as a sort of form of abusive language. Generally, they're sent to famous people um, or people in the public eye. So in Panning Poison, I look at hate mail sent to vicars, for example. It's quite a lot of clergymen who receive letters like this. Sometimes just because uh, the writer knows where to send it to. So you just send it to the vicarage and it will get there. And sometimes for other purposes. So I look at a case from the 1880s, 1890s that was clearly inspired by racist sentiments. And I look at cases of letters sent to footballers, for example, complaining about their play and to a female writers and to the car manufacturer, Herbert Austin, who gets a, an amazing series of postcards sent to him. So that's hate mail. And, that, I mean, and, it's, because, and it's because these people represent something. So you have the vicar who is, is the moral pillar. You have a, a woman who's uh, who's who's um, has power, which can be threatening. And then you have yep. someone who's like a, a someone who's a captain of industry and represents power in that way. Is that what is that what yeah. sort of yelling into the void by sending these letters? Oh yeah, the, yeah. And I'm, absolutely. Also, overinvestment and things like your football team, so, <laughs> you know, just, just all sorts of things like that. So, other than the suppose things we would understand of hate mail work their way into poison pen letters as well. Elements also of uh, letters like blackmail letters also work their way into poison pen letters. And sometimes it's not clear whether somebody is being gossipy or is a tip off, putting whistleblowing, that sort of thing in a letter that looks like blackmail, but could be hate mail. 
So some of these letters, they kind of, if you think of a Venn diagram of letters, they'll intersect quite a lot. And you can't be sure because you don't know what the motivation of the writer was. Poison pen letters, though, they become a very specific type of letter in the early 20th century. And so that's the sort of letter that we now would understand as an anonymous letter. This sort letter in uh, the fiction from the mid 20th century, Dorothy L. Sayers, Agatha Christie, that sort of thing. Now that, um, that the, the term poison pen letter is an American term. It was uh, coined by the Maryland Evening Post in 1911. And it became a really specific form of letter writing associated with women. And that's why it gets the term poison pen letter, because women were seen as poisoners. So the, the choice of murder uh, for women is seen as poisoning. So therefore the choice of poison. I think it's a, I think it's a collection of a, co a sort of coalescence of lots of cases coming at the same time, which happens in England as well, or Britain as well. It's also seen as poisoning a neighborhood. So it's poisoning a community a sort of, or an institution, that sort of thing, a close-knit area. So it's spreading poison within there. And, mm. th and those were unsettling. They could take various forms. They could be threats. They could be obscenities or they could be libels or they could be a bit of everything. They could spread malicious gossip, etc. Now, sometimes they're, they're just kind of a little bit uncanny and you can't be sure whether there are any of these things, they're sort of a, they can be a bit weird that you're not really sure whether it's someone saying they know something more about you or dropping in some details. And I think these letters have been massively um, under um, reported to the police because some people will get a letter and think, what is this about? Is don't really understand. So those letters as well, I think, the sort of curious, uncanny, unsettling letters that, that often people will get and just think, well, that's a bit odd, not sure what that is. You might only pay attention to that if you get another one, and then it's sort of like this is part of a series. But we often ignore things if we just think, well, that's odd, not sure what it is. Something that I found really interesting um, in your book was this idea of how sometimes the vulgarity in the language that we see in these letters that are is just unbelievable, especially when you find out who the person was who did it. And oftentimes that's someone trying to throw someone off their scent. They're a, a character. And in a recent episode we did with Dr. James Forrester, uh, which is a pretty famous case, um, it seemed he exaggerated that language, uh, some horrible language, and did some horrible things, especially to young women, in an effort to I guess, be thought of as someone else or to throw someone off the scent. Um, is that common with a poison pen letter campaign? Yeah, absolutely. Now, and it also shows you that somebody with quite a strong control of the language and the medium, so usually someone who's quite well educated, can throw uh, other people off the scent of the fact that they're the author by pretending to be less articulate or less able to wield a pen or less able to know how grammar works, for example. So if I actually found in, in writing the book that um, it was surprising that people who are very clever would often pretend to be very stupid or illiterate almost. Uh, and they would use sort of, and, and they didn't always manage to keep that going for the whole campaign. <laughs> so their first few letters would sort of have a lot of spelling errors. So spelling errors, deliberate spell spelling errors are one way to make the receiver and the police think, well, it can't be someone well, well educated. And right. that's something that surprised me. The number of the cases that are actually written by people who have a lot of cultural capital. So they're well able to get what they want through other means, but they're still using anonymous letters and they're pretending to be less intelligent than they are or less educated than they are specifically. And, and what does that say? Is it trying to not just you know trick someone into thinking you're somebody else, but the desire to be seen less intelligent, does that say something about class or, or try to put it on someone who's of a lower social status? Yeah, I, I think it is just shifting the blame. So it, it's a it's a way of sort of saying, oh, well, how, I'm so intelligent, I know how to write a letter, and I'm now going to use that intelligence to write a letter in a completely different way, so that people won't assume it's me. 
And I've got letters going back. I, I look at letters in the 19th century that this is clearly the case, that people are wearing a sort of mantle beneath them in order to um, not be exposed as the letter writer. And often those letters are ones that they end up getting some political benefit from or economic benefit from. Um, so they're very different letters in the 19th century to the 20th century because you get many more of those sort of pretend letters in that way. The pretense goes in other ways in the 20th century. Um, so it depends again on the type of writer. You still get those examples of you know people not using grammar or running all capital letters um, in together without any spaces at all. Mm -hmm. um, again, to disguise their normal writing style or to just make it look as though they don't know how to write. But clearly, it's um, it's quite a sophisticated way of writing that looks like an unsophisticated way of writing. So there are all sorts of things going on to do with disguise, but also to do with pretense. What What seems to bother people about poison pen letters is a is a knowing that someone else has a knowing about that person. Yeah. What What is the desired reaction from a poison pen writer? Is it a release for, on their end, or is it really a desire to create a emotional disturbance? I think it can be all of those things, and I some I think sometimes the writer won't necessarily know. And so, if you look at things like um, internet abuse now. Some people who have questioned, well, why did you write these horrible below the line comments? Uh, the people who are asked these questions sort of go, well, I, I don't really know. And just sort of, I wrote it yesterday. I can't really remember why and what I was feeling at that time. And I think a lot of feelings sort of develop into, um, into a moment where somebody thinks, well, the thing I need to do is let somebody know. I think it's largely about wanting to be part of the conversation part of the societal conversation, but not really feeling like you have room at the table. So, you know, write a letter instead. You make a really great connection between these letters and, and the rise of what we would call, you know, postal technology. We don't think as stamps as postal technology, but the ability to mail something and stick a, a stamp on it had a huge influence yeah. in the increase. So we think hitting send uh, on an email is impulsive, but it sounds to me like being able to mail a letter could be equally seen as impulsive, an angry letter that you throw into the mail. The thing is, with these cases, is posting it, not writing it. So some people were very specifically charged with posting things because posting is seen as publishing it, particularly if it has a threat in it or particularly if it's obscene or libelous. So it kind of didn't matter in some ways who had written the letter. It was who put it in the post box. Uh -huh. And that's why there's a lot of attention, particularly to women writers. Lots of police are are put on, are stationed to watch female writers posting letters. So it's like, uh -huh. then they don't have to prove they wrote it. They just have to prove they sent it. Because sending it is that publishing. So that then taps into those laws against obscenities and libel, et cetera. So one of the women I look at in the book is Annie Tugwell. Yes, I was going to ask Annie. you that. That's a really great case, please. So Annie Tugwell first got into trouble in 1910, but had probably been writing letters long before that. She was married to the local registrar, so of medium, sort of like, she wasn't, she wasn't low class, she was middle class, um, sort of. Uh, the sort of respectable part of society. And she lived in a, in a leafy suburb of London. And in 1910, she was prosecuted for writing letters. Now, her case is very complicated because it seems that she learned to write in other people's handwriting, to throw the blame to them. Mm -hmm. So she'd learned to write in the housekeeper of a local Catholic canon, Canon Catherata. She'd learned to write in his... Uh, house housekeeper's handwriting, then wrote letters insinuating things about the canon, about the Catholic canon, as though his housekeeper was writing the letters. So it's super manipulative and super complicated. And initially, it's the housekeeper, Annie Dewey, who goes to court because it seems that this sort of attempt to throw the throw the blame onto somebody else has succeeded. 
Then as that case works its through works its way through the court case, it becomes clear that Annie Dewey hadn't written the letters somebody else had. So then the next court case focuses on Annie Tugwell, who seems to be writing these letters. Now they get they get Annie Dewey in trouble for writing the letters, but they're basically focused on the Catholic priest. The Catholic priest, it, it makes him look like he's ordering lots of beer or he's got an illegitimate child, that sort of thing. They're very subtle letters. And so she goes to prison for writing those letters. Eventually, they work out it's Annie Tugwell. But it's a little bit more complicated than that because when the police try to get material against her, they appear to fabricate that material. Hmm. So they say they found blotting paper, incriminating blotting paper in the pockets of her skirts. And she says, there are no pockets in my skirts. And she gets her dressmakers to come in and say, there are no pockets in Annie Tugwell's every skirt. Woman, every woman knows when we have pockets. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and the, the fashion in, 19, in the 1910s was a very sleek line. There were no pockets. But the police knew their mothers with their pockets, with their dowdy clothes, with their pockets. And so eventually the police start saying, let's ignore that information. It doesn't really matter. But clearly she's being framed in some way because they haven't got enough information against her. So there's, there's a lot of suspicious things going on in, nine, in the 1910 case. And I'm not convinced that Annie Tugwell wrote all of the letters at that time. She was seen posting some later in 1913. In 1913, she's at it again, they think. She's writing letters now to her sister-in-law and to a solicitor. And so they post three policemen for three weeks to watch her. And they want to catch her posting a letter because then that's like, ta-da, we found you posting these letters. Now, the complication comes a little bit later. She eventually ends up in a mental asylum. And a third mental asylum. So she goes to prison, but then she's 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 um, put it into uh, the asylum system. So Annie Tugwell um, starts as a woman of of of, of social prominence. Who yeah, is accused of these letters. Uh, someone else initially takes the blame for those letters, uh -huh. and then over a, a long investigation, they r arrest Annie Tugwell potentially with fabricated evidence, and then she yeah. ends up in an asylum. Yeah, connected to the case. Yeah, Nancy, it gets weirder. In the <laughs> asylum, she gets anonymous letters in the same handwriting. They're sent to her there. So I think, to some degree, Annie Tugwell's framed by somebody. Somebody else is writing letters to make it look like Annie Tugwell is writing letters in somebody else's handwriting. So let's go back to that idea at the start when I was saying that people um, use their abilities of writing things in really strange ways. And if they've got lots of cultural capital, they can actually use that to their advantage in, in different ways, whilst looking like they're people without a lot of cultural capital. So it's well, really and I think in, in your book, Annie Tugwell's husband leaves her after her first conviction. Yeah. Um, you know, 12 years of hard labor, I mean, 12 months of hard labor, um, I guess on, on, on libel, is that what the, the criminal charge was? Obscene libel. Obscene libel. Yeah. Um, and also first use of the word troll. Is that what is that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's used It's used as sort of uh, dirty trolls. So it's used in a slightly weird way. It's almost like um, um, it's almost like a sort of derogatory term for, for people rather than trolling. But it's a lovely, lovely connection to later ideas about trolling. Yeah. So you identify a couple of things in that story, and, and it's a really terrific se sequence in your book. Um, and it hits upon a few things that I think are worth getting into in this conversation. Um, that one, um, it's women who are writing these letters. And we talked about, you know, the the desire of the poison pen letter. But why in this particular time were women believed to be more capable of writing these letters and that there might be an increase in the poison le po poison pen letters by women? There are not more letters being written by women, but there's more attention to the letters written by women. Uh -huh. So I think the same sorts of letters are continuing from men that have always been written by men. So the first half of Penning Poison very much focuses, because I pursue it chronologically, it very much focuses on letters written by men to other men. 
And it's only when we get to around about 1895 that suddenly it becomes a focus on women writing letters, and particularly women writing obscene letters, which some of these letters are. And it sort of becomes then an obsession with various people. So it becomes an obsession with the newspapers, it becomes an obsession with the police and the legal systems, and to, to some degree, the psychologists as well. So they are, all start getting very focused on this idea of female letter writers. But I wasn't convinced that um, there weren't also lots of men writing letters at the same time that are getting ignored. I think the attention starts being focused on these women's letters because they're doing something they're seen as not they're not supposed to do particularly if they include obscenities in their letters, as in the Littlehampton case. So um, it's sort of like it becomes seen as poison pen letter writing becomes seen as an outlet for se sexual frustration and a, you know, a sort of sense of uptightedness. We've got that now, this idea of the sexually repressed spinster being the letter writer. Yes. And I think that makes news. I think people get really just, they just, catch on to that. But the context is women trying to get female suffrage. Yes. And that's why I think there's all this attention. It's sort of like saying, well, if we give women a bit more power, they're going to abuse it in this way, just like they're abusing letter writing in this way, right. poisoning their environments, poisoning their communities. And I think that's why we get this attention to women's letter writing at the time. But I'm not convinced there aren't also more men writing letters like this. So we, what we get is the focus on the women because it, it's more newsworthy. In your book, you say something really interesting, though, about this connection between women having literacy rates that are on par with men's during this period in time, but they don't have the social capital or the agency or the power, which might suggest why a woman would write these letters more than a man would. Can you talk a little bit about that and the connection between those literacy rates and then the and the frustration that might be the result of, of writing these letters? Yeah, and I think there's something else ties into it as well, and that is the capacity to defend yourself at law. So that this is again why we get more of these uh, female letter cases, because it's quite hard to accuse a man of something if they have good legal defenses. They can bring in the lawyers and counter sue. Mm. So women generally can't do that. And most of the women that I look at in the book have no legal defense. So they don't have a legal team. And it's only in one of the cases, um, say Mary Johnson, who is wrongly accused in the 1910s. And in her case, she goes to court three times before she ends up having any legal defense. And she only has that because she's also in court with her husband, because she's got this absolute locked down alibi. So they start saying, oh, they're doing it as a team then. And then yeah. so her husband's also in court and then it's determined that he's illiterate. So he couldn't have been writing the letters. It's only at that point that attention is thrown onto the actual letter writer. Now, I think in many of the cases that I look at, and I did look at the sort of their childhoods. So in these cases from the 1910s to the 1920s, there are five cases that I go into quite a lot of detail. And I look at their childhoods and I look at their current situations. So a lot of them are, say, very intelligent and have brothers who are pushed above them, who get schooled, who get training, who get great jobs. And this goes into the 1930s as well. So one of the letter writers I look at in the 1930s fits this scenario as well. So they have siblings. Um, and their brothers go and do great jobs, interesting things, and they are expected to marry and keep home and or, or not, because not that many of them get married. So they have these expectations of marriage or not, or, or in, one, in the Littlehampton case, um, a sense of repressed background, again, not really being able to move outside of that. Um, now, on top of that, women weren't expected to use swear words, that sort of mm. thing, but they hear them, but they're not expected to use them. And so I think a lot of this builds into this frustration. They see brothers being advanced. They see other people getting into jobs that they're not very good at. They see, um, they see opportunities that are denied to them, like having education or um, 
or leaving to go traveling or anything like that. And so they're often um, either married, stuck at home, or looking after parents or some scenarios like that. And then if you dig deeply into their childhood traumas, they often have incredibly difficult childhoods as well. So things like um, very unstable um, family backgrounds when they're very small or moving around a lot or having a lot of brothers and sisters die, for example. Uh -huh. So I think there's a lot of trauma that builds into this sense of frustration and then they feel that they're trapped in a particular situation. And so one woman I look at, she's called Molly Lee. Um, she lived in London and Brighton. She ends up, so she's quite elevated class. She's the solicitor's wife, I think. It's a while since I've looked at her, her life. And she ends up sort of pretending she's like this gangster's mole and that she um, she's part of this gang. And you can just see her trying to have a more exciting life on paper by just pre trying something out, trying out a different life. And lots of the women that I look at um, in that chapter do likewise. So Kathleen O'Brien in 1914 in Hove is clearly trying out this idea that what would it be like to be seen as someone with really loose sexual morals? What would it be like to be described as a prostitute? She's, she's trying out these ideas. And I think this is something to do with childhood trauma coming through, some, some problems like that. None of the writers that I looked at had an easy childhood. I see. And so I think this is feeding into it. So trauma that's pushed through a sort of sense of them being trapped in adulthood. And in, in, in those in, in those cases, who were their targets? Were they writing for um, themselves or were they writing to others? Oh, complicated. So those all write decoy letters. So they write to themselves, but they also write to other people as well. Um, in in three of those cases, the people that they um, that they make it look are writing the letter cases go to court. So they're quite successful, and they're sort of throwing the police off the scent. Um, and I that would that not give them a sense of empowerment that they've made this happen? It's like you know, I've started this off, and the police are doing things because of my actions. So. And I think they often get quite um, almost addicted to that attention and they can't stop writing the letters because right. it's sort of like suddenly their lives become quite full, exciting. They hear about themselves and the gossip in the community and they'll think, well, that's me. They'll have a sense of knowing something that no one else knows, which they might never have had if they've had difficult childhoods. They'd have been confused a lot of the time. And now right. all of a sudden they know and they only them know what the real thing is happening. So I, I think a lot of these psychological quirks develop quite gradually, um, but I think they are caused by scenarios that people were put in, that, they, that they're working out in the letters. You, um, you talk about the, the sort of the detective work that would have to go into looking at these poison pen letters. What was the legal gray area? We understand the social consequences of these letters, but... What were the legal and uh, and criminal consequences, and how were they ultimately able to use the means of police work to solve these cases? So you could you could look at um, handwriting analysis, but it was it was in its infancy um, in the sort of uh, mid to late nineteenth century, and it never really was fully trusted. So the police have various ways of um, of trying to find somebody uh, writing a letter. So handwriting analysis. That's, but often you'd find that you'd have, for the defence and for the prosecution, a handwriting analyst. And so often you get people saying, well, who do we believe? Who is the actual expert here? And if the experts are disagreeing, then it's a classic legal problem. Now, the key development comes in the 19th century, but it's only really pushed in the early 20th century. And it's the post office investigation branch, known as the men of secrets. If you look at pictures of them, they really don't look. They don't fit the, the, the sort of group name there. Now, they develop, particularly in the 1920s, and they're involved in the Little Hampton case, they develop all sorts of investigatory um, procedures, including things like marking up stationery that, they, um, that the police um, dress, that disguise themselves and sell to people, 
not marking up stamps. So using like um, invisible ink to mark a stamp and then sell it to particular people. Um, they do all sorts of things. They look inside pillar boxes with periscopes to see who's posting what. And and then they get the police, like with Annie Tugwell in 1913, they get the police to watch pillar boxes and see who's posting things. So it's old-fashioned detective work. And in the Littlehampton case, a policewoman is basically in a, in a florist's shed just watching the proceedings. So that in the Wicked Little Letters film, absolutely true. So, um, it's 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 fascinating because you think uh, so in this film Wicked Little Letters it, there are three really important women there are the the one who's the alleged victim there's the woman who's accused of writing the letters those next door neighbors and then there's a a woman police officer that they keep saying <laughs> and she's like the first of her kind and so that was real that was a true story oh yeah Gladys Moss really did crack it she she saw uh, she saw a letter being dropped. It was complicated then thereafter because the the police um, the police had a solid case, but the lawyers and particularly the judge kept steering the the juries to to um, acquit who the the person the actual writer. Um, but Gladys Moss did a lot of the investigatory work, so she was uh, she was stationed in a florist's shed that was in the backyard area of this very tight knit small um, community. And so, and and so in Littlehampton, what you have is you've got a passageway, and one house is off to the right, and another house is in the garden, and these are the two people involved in the letter writing campaign, and Gladys Moss hides in a shed in the garden area, so she's well positioned to watch everything because she's a woman police officer, she can dress up and observe things. Nobody is going to notice. So it's her, her camouflage, her invisibility comes from her femininity. If she'd been a man, that had gone wiser a man in the florist shed watching people. But a woman doing things is just ignored because it's like seen as not important stuff. So she gets all the important material. Well, and it gets, I guess it gets to the, the, the dual heart of the nature of these cases. The woman who's unseen, who wants to write the letters to be seen, and then the female police officer who utilizes her invisibility to her advantage to, to shed light on that case. That's so interesting. Yeah. Um, you, in your book, you say something that really stood out to me, and that you say that this book could be about shame, that the letter writing, essentially, this is a book about shame. What did you mean by that? What is shame? What does that have to do with the poison pen letters? Oh, I mean, shame runs throughout the book. Shame is everywhere in the book. It's in the receivers. It's in the senders. It's 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 just everywhere. It's also there's a community level involvement of the shame, because I think um, I think shaming in communities is one of the things that fosters and fuels these letter writing campaigns as well. So we've got a feedback loop that's very circular and is returning back to the community all the time. This idea of shame. If we look at historic communities, neighbours were always expected to police each other. So they're expected to watch out you know, for immoral behaviour. And in the past, they, uh, people who were seen as immoral would be subjected to Sharivaris and Skimmingtons. I think this is quite similar. I think there's a similar level of, I see what you do and you put your, you put your washing out on a Sunday or you put the wrong thing and you're recycling. These sorts of shameful behaviours that can be interpreted at a minute, petty level by neighbours who are getting obsessed with things. And so, um, so shame comes in a lot. I mean, shame comes in very directly sometimes. It comes in when people are, are told things like, um, you, you, so I'm reading from one of the cases here, you ought to be jolly well ashamed of yourself for marrying a girl of 17. And this is sent to a vicar of 55. So there's this sense that we know your shame and we're picking it up and we're writing it in a letter. So very overtly, shame is mentioned. I mean, that's almost yeah. like a truth to power thing, though, you know, it's yeah, like, uh -huh. it is. And, and that caused me a lot of um, a lot of ethical dilemmas, because I'd be looking at these cases and I'd start going, OK, let's have a think about it. So 1938, uh, Winifred Sim Simner writes letters. Now, she's a very elevated member of the society in Wimbledon, where she's from. She comes from a very upper class uh, family. 
And she is writing letters that insinuate or actually directly say that members of the local council are on the take and on the make. They're stealing money from the poppy campaign. They're, um, they're marrying the... In one case, she complains about a lawyer who marries um, a woman who he defends in a divorce case. And, and I looked into all of the stories that Simna was writing about, and there is truth to a lot of them. And it made me queasy, because then I thought, am I re-victimized? Am I making these people a victim again mm. by putting them in the book? So I ended up taking a lot of the detail out, because I thought, is it my role to re-victimize in these situations? So, but she was very much saying, it's shameful for you to be in a position in the local authority if you are not morally strong and up, upright, you know, if you don't, if you don't follow the morals of the community. So she is shaming people by writing the letters. But but it comes into it in the other way as well. It's shameful to not sign a letter if you if you feel you want to say something and you're not signing it. Then that's seen as a cowardly thing to do with a sense of shame as well. Um, Ultimately, then there's the shame of being revealed as the writer. So I look at that with Winifred Simno. You know what happens when she actually is revealed as the writer, and her world collapses a little bit at this point. Um, although she does seemingly get everything back together again, because the higher the status of the writer, the more likely they are to be excused. So, what does the person sending the letter get out of it? <laughs> but, that's the ultimate question, isn't it? I think they they get, they get. I think they get a sort of kick that they're um, hurting someone often. But sometimes I think they just get a sense of belonging, a sense that they are alive, that they do have an impact. And then sometimes it's hard to know why you would write a letter if you don't know any of those things. If you just send that out and then don't follow it up. So that's why I think lots of these letters are sent within neighbourhoods, because you can get that gossip that comes the other way. Who's had a letter? What's going on? And I think that is what people feed off. And I'm not always sure that the sender knows w quite what they want. They just want something back. They may be feeling they're not getting a lot back from their community. They're not in a position to know anything. And they're not in a position to impact anything, to have an effect on anything. So they want a little bit of that because they see other people having it. And that's that's kind of what I think probably explains most of them. There's something very uh, unsettling about a letter from the collective we. And in your book, you know, Cheek to Jowl, it gets into this idea of how close we are to each other and how we're sort of constantly patrolling and policing and finding these little injustices and trying to correct those injustices. But there's something about this idea of a collective we of we're watching you or your friends or your neighbors. Why is that so unsettling? Yeah, so um, I found this went back quite a long way. So this is something you see in the 18th century letters and the 19th century letters. And it's, it, again, another method of, of making it look like you're just not a lone operator. You've got a whole housing estate, a whole community, a whole village behind you. You've got, you're in a gang, you're in a team, you know, it's not just your idea. And these are most common in threatening letters. So it's threatening letters that, that have more heft if it looks like it's not just from a weird loan operator, but there's lots yeah. of people there as well. Now, those letters, the type that you've got, they went up massively in COVID lockdown times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, they were. Oh, they were. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> People really start focusing on minutiae when they've got nothing else to do. They focus on the neighborhood. When you, when you, I mean, I, I found I, I, I was more interested in neighbors when I just had a baby because I wasn't going to work every day. And I noticed the neighbors. It's like, oh, hey, there are neighbors. <laughs> what are they doing? Why are they parking there? The sorts of things that I'd never paid attention to because I was bored, <laughs> nothing else to do. And I think that happened a lot in COVID times that people, People's sense of what was interesting just turned into who's walking down the street, who's at large, who's not obeying the lockdown. Well, and 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 similar to the 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 stories that you're telling in in this book and in your previous books, 
it's about this close proximity of people who during COVID, we all had to coexist and we didn't, we were centered the way that communities used to be centered, these small towns where are small villages. So I couldn't just dash off to Target and pick up something. I had to either ask for a favor or use, use it was a whole different type of currency. In, in a strange way, one's reputation is yeah. about the kind of currency. So let's talk about that reputation versus money or or how it's its own form of power and how important that was. Yeah, so reputation, um, and it's forged in communities. So reputation is is developed in these communities. And um this this was this is one of the themes that came up in the book. So um uh women's reputations are usually determined by their sexual propriety, whether they're chaste, whether they're faithful, etc. And that very much came through in the things people were writing in these letters. And so reputations are determined for women often by their sexual behavior. For men, not at all. And so for men, it's about whether they are fair dealers in business. And lots of the letters, therefore, are about employment. You sacked me incorrectly, this sort of thing. They're determined by uh, their political power, their economic heft, that sort of thing. So women's letters or letters that involve women are very much focused on sexuality. You know what, as well, they're focused very much in the 1920s on things like hair color. So in the 1920s, a lot of the letters say, I know that you you dye your hair. And what they're talking about is bleaching hair. <laughs> so this idea of women who are going around with not their right hair color becomes a total focus. Something that really surprised me in the film uh, Wig Wicked Little Letters and in some of the excerpts in your book was the language. Um, that I found it to be pretty colorful for that era. Um, were you, did you get, were you surprised? Were you laughing when you saw some of the language in these letters? Was there, was there something quaint about it? Or were you shocked at the, at the vulgarity in it as compared to today? Um, yes, um, particularly with Annie Tugwell's letters. So um, in some ways, the Little Hampton letters are, are huh, quite overshadowed by the letters in the Annie Tugwell case. There are also drawings that I saved the readers from. Now, they look a lot like adolescent boys' drawings of genitalia, for example. Um, oh, sure. In every bathroom wall, in every school. Every yeah. And just to remind Things listeners, everything. Annie Tugwell <laughs> is the case where she um, in, in tried to incriminate someone then she was found guilty, and then you suspect that she might have been framed at least a little bit with this whole, you know, blotters in the fake pockets. Okay, so she, but, you know, you get, there were drawings, including the language. Oh, yeah, there's drawings, yeah. Really weird drawings that I can't really make any sense of. But what they say to me, these, like, I've shown the drawings to quite a lot of people. Uh, you've got to be quite careful who you share drawings like this to. <laughs> but whenever I have, I've said, do these look like something a woman, a woman would draw? And everyone's always said, no, 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 that's what that's what boys do. That's just pictures that boys do. <laughs> so that, that that threw me. And in uh, Annie Tugwell's case, the C word is used quite a lot. So that, that was a surprise to me that that's flying around everywhere in, in those letters. Wow. Yeah. Um no, I think I think we tend to assume that in the past there wasn't very much uh, swearing. Now women didn't swear, but there was overheard quite a lot of swearing. For example, if you were having um, work done on a house and the decorating team were coming in, and I think this is where, in the Little Hampton case, the person learned all of their swear words um, on, a, on a, a sort of building site. I think that level of um, swearing was, was quite similar to a level of swearing that we have now. Uh, and that would be surprising, but it wasn't recorded because that wasn't the done thing in the nine in the nineteen tens, nineteen twenties to put into writing. Right. So you, it doesn't filter through in the same way. And therefore, I think these these people writing these letters are sort of exploring something in their writing. They're exploring a sense of pornographic writing or. Um, a, a fluidity of writing that they're not able to do in any other ways, hence not putting their name on it. Um, but what's quite interesting is that the men who are doing these things are generally then being excused in court for really weak excuses. They say, oh, I'm addicted to morphine or I was mesmerized or I had the flu. Whereas women who were found to be writing these letters were just seen as 
sexual perverts, that sort of thing, you know. And and there's a very different interpretation on um, why they wrote the letters at that point. And and then the consequences of that would be prison in in some instances. Yes. Now, for women, it was definitely often 12 months in prison, sometimes with hard labor. Um, so like mending mail bags or, um, or other menial tasks like that. So a lot of the women in that, that were, um, guilty, that were found guilty or, uh, were wrongly found guilty in some cases were, did get hard labor in prison. A lot of the men often get fines. So I have this case of a man, um, who, and I think this is a bit later. I think this is in the 1930s. He was found to be writing letters, as in he was watched writing letters. It was obvious he was writing letters. He was found in the process of doing them. And he was allowed to say in court that he he, he shouldn't be punished because he was very respectable. And they said, "What what's the evidence of your respectability? And he came out with, with my favorite of all the excuses. He says he c- couldn't be um, a rough sort of person because he's been to Canada three times. And they go, oh, right, okay then. And they just give him a £10 fine. So this is a man in Utoxeter in, in Britain. Um, at the same time, lots of women are doing much less uh, obscene, uh, writing much less obscene letters and getting a year's hard labor. So again, it's this attention, this newsworthiness. And also the men have the ability to defend themselves in court because they've got more money to put forward to uh, defense. But yeah, that was his excuse. I can't have done it because I've been to Canada. They would divide. Then they wouldn't let him in unless he was very polite. We all know that. <laughs> Your book ends in 1940 for for obvious reasons that there's a, an advancement in technology that makes poison pen letters either what harder to track and, and and fewer of them. But when you were researching this book, did you find yourself thinking about current 21st century technological parallels? So there are, there are parallels, uh, and, and part of the change that happens in 1940 is also phone calls, so those heavy breathing phone calls. So we get a, a proliferation of different types of communications. So I found that there were similarities and there are differences. One of the similarities is that you get a sort of anonymity creates a disinhibition. So because you're not putting your name to it, you write things that you ordinarily wouldn't write. Well, we see that online, don't we? That's the sort of below the line comments and the hate mail abuse that you get and the trolling that you get online. So similar ideas there, because you're not signing your name, then you don't have the same inhibitions that you would if you were. You also get role playing in the things we've sort of been talking about already. So you get this we this collective sense, this community, this moral voice of the community coming through. We are just the moral voice. And and so that's similar as well. But letters that come through the post could be followed by a person coming to the door. Letters that go to the internet are not so directed into your physical space. So there is a key difference. However, Letters that go to your personal house, you can decide who sees them. You could burn them. You could destroy them. But anonymous hatred put out online could be seen by loads of people. It could be seen by people before you see it. You know, so there's a massive difference there. So the potential audience for the um, cruel remarks or comments or hate mail is massive, but it's not directed at you in your house. And so I think I think this, it swings of roundabouts, isn't it? It's sort of like, well, one is bad, but also that is bad. And I think, therefore, they have similarities, but also massive differences, too. Receiving a letter, it's intimate, but it also is private. No one's, no one else seems, no one else knows what the contents of that letter say. You do. Yeah. And something that I found to be potentially disconcerting if you were to receive those letters was wondering, who is it? Why would they think this about me? In in the episode I just did on on James Forster, the recipients of these letters knew that they hadn't done it. The, this man who was a father of four was considered, you know, a layabout, a flasher. He was accused of being a sexual predator, and he knew these things weren't true. But he couldn't stop thinking about someone else thinking that about him, which gets back to yeah. this idea, I suppose, of a reputation. Um, so even though you knew these things weren't true, they were traumatic. Yeah. Which 
one would think it's private and it's not true. So what do I care? I'm just going to throw it away. But in, in, in your book, people burn the letters, which made it why it's so difficult for you to find some of these. What's the what's the desire to burn them, even though you know they're not true? How did it have such a psychological traumatic impact on people? Again, I think it's the sense that what what if somebody else does think it's true? It's this having this potentially shameful object around. But it's also that, I mean, it was seen as the sort of sensible thing to do. It, often the police and the judges would say, why are you paying attention to this? We get loads of these all the time and we just get rid of them. But we're only looking at a very small sample of the letters sent. So, and, and why they were retained might make them atypical letters. So in a historical methodology, I'm I'm already using my own tainted sources, if you see what I mean, because I, I'm not looking at the whole collection of letters that were written. I can only look from the receiver's end. I can only look at the letters that were kept. In when there's gray area of, of law, or there's a or if something's morally confusing, it seems to be when we want to like reach out and and try and define it for ourselves. And did you find there were instances of that, of things that simmered as a as a community issue that was a legitimate ethical question that then actually found its way into forging some type of change? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure that I know of any of the letters that, that led to a change or any of the campaigns, or any of the scenarios. And again, I think that's because of what I was saying earlier, that the letters come from the community, essentially. They right. are fueled by the community, and they go back into the community. And mm -hmm. so um, I think it's more a sort of, I mean, in some ways it's quite depressing, but I think it's more of a sort of self-fulfilling, continual process, rather than something that people develop from. Um, there are lots of ideas, um, there are lots of suspicions when these campaigns start, and some of the campaigns are very long. One of the ones in um, Robin Hood's Bay went on for a good 20 years, um, and it was only, so maybe this is a moment where there was change. So one of the vicars who was, a nearby vicar, is, he, he was a couple of miles up the coast, he got letters, and the letters sent to him were about him shooting birds. And he left, he left the area. And then a new vicar came along and he really wanted to tackle this head on because um, partly because there was a, a shocking incident of a woman who was accused of killing her own baby who became suicidal. And so it was when there was this massive flashpoint that, oh, you know, somebody's really responded to this in a really dramatic way. Then the second vicar involved in the, in the case started talking about it in the sermons and then found that it was massive and loads of people were getting them. And it was only him putting it out there in sermons that got the community returning it back and saying, oh, we've had one and we've had one. And then they started to say, well, why haven't you raised this earlier? And it was like, well, we didn't want to draw attention to ourselves. We didn't want to be the only ones who were the focus of attention. And by him drawing attention to this, it ended up ending it. You know, because it was almost like it was out in the open. It was nobody's dirty secret anymore. They worked out how long it had been going on for. I don't think they ever found out who did it. Or actually, I think they might have found out who did it, but they kind of said, oh, let's, let's not pursue this. Um, so in that case, when you get a dynamic member of the community tackling it head on, and I think it can only be a vicar in that situation because they can have the community... Uh, listen to them and they're not the police, they don't represent power in the same way, then I think you can, you I did get a sense in that community that they started to heal and and sort of work things out together. Only when, so one vicar did nothing and just left, but when the second vicar came in and, and kind of tried to proactively manage the scenario, I got an impression of a, of, of a, a community that was dealing with a lot of its ghosts and a lot of its skeletons at that point. One who is in a powerful position can leverage that power to open things up and, and you know, shed some sunlight on the black mold of suspicion yeah. and, and shame. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate your time and your book, Penning Poison, The History of Anonymous Letters. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you for listening to another episode of Dead Sleep, True Crime for Bedtime. 
I will be back in a few days with an all new true crime story made for nighttime listening. Until next time, nighty night.